You're listening to Bridge the Gap Season 4, a podcast dedicated to inform, educate, and influence the future of housing and services for seniors. This podcast is powered by supporting partners, Propel Insurance, Inquire, LTC REIT, The Bridge Group Construction, and Salinity. Learn more at btgvoice.com. Welcome to Bridge the Gap Podcast, the Senior Living Podcast with Josh and Lucas. We are doing more thought leadership conversations. We want to welcome Chris Hollister. He's the CEO of Pegasus Senior Living out of Texas. Welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you. Very, very glad to be here. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Just flew in last night, a <laughs> long flight. Uh, you know, people don't get a lot of sleep when they're at NIT because uh, it's a, you know, the continuous speed dating and events on and on and on. Chris, this is obviously you're not not your first time at a conference like this. You got your start a while back. Uh, take us back to the beginning. What interested you in the whole senior housing play? Well, thanks. Thanks again for having me. You know, I didn't have a passion for senior living growing up. Uh, you kind of get into it one way or another, and most people become sort of lifers because it is a very rewarding uh, field to be in. I, I was in banking. I had a, an MBA, got out, and... Uh, took the only job offer I had at a bank in Dallas where I grew up and um, things were not going well in Texas banking in the 80s my dad was with a different bank he said if you got out of banking you should so I did okay. and I answered an ad for a financial analyst I'd always been interested in how companies make big capital decisions so it was a great job it was Greystone uh, shout out to Mike Lanahan and Paul Steinhoff and those guys they, they did CCRC development for hospitals And it was a great entree into the sector because I got to go all over the country looking at different markets and really putting the marketing piece together, the market data demographics, with the financial, how much does it cost to build? Because anything can work if you have unlimited demand, uh, but no one has to pay for it, right? (laughs) But you have to try to make an intelligent decision for those things. It was a great training ground. And that was the late, that was 86 to 89. And we were seeing that uh, their typical community would have anywhere from 120 to 200 independent living. And for your college student listeners, that's, you know, more of a hospitality product where people are getting, you know, housekeeping, laundry, one to three meals a day. We, you know, it was one back then. And we'd have a small assist living piece. And then we would do a nursing home a few times if we could get the certificate of need. Okay. And the assist living was just filling up. We weren't even marketing it, it was filling up. So a guy, uh, Mike Doyle, that, that, that worked there, he moved to Boston and uh, said, I'm going to move to Boston and start a company. I want you to come with me. And I became CFO of that. That became the Standish Care Company. Very early days. No one knew what assisting was. I call it golden retriever looks. You'd go into a meeting with <laughs> private equity people and you'd tell them what you're doing. And they'd kind of go, you mean like a nurse? No, we mean like a private pay care. <laughs> right. Well, we don't know what you're talking about. And, you know, uh, Paul and Terry Clausen, uh, had started Sunrise, so they were going, and that started, but that was more of a hiring product. So Standish kind of went sideways, we got bought out. I wrote a business plan in North Carolina. I, I went to business school at uh, Duke and married a girl from Carolina, and and really almost in a cathartic way said, if I was gonna do a business plan, here's what I would do, and didn't even know if it was going to be a, a business yet. <laughs> and that became Southern Assisted Living, which we were really one of the first operators to go to middle market sort of Walmart towns and put memory care under the same roof. Single story wood frame construction, middle market product. Mm -hmm. That was very innovative in 1996. And we built 17 of those, bought out our biggest competitor and had a very successful culture. Very proud of the culture we had there and the financial results were were very good. And a a shout out to Steve Morton, the co-founder of that with me. And and Rich Williams was there with me, who's now joined us as chief operating officer. So I sold that company in 06. And decided to take a break a bit because if you you know you let you let you work around seniors and you figure out the whole gig doesn't last that long. If you talk to an 85 year old in our community and go, wow, I can't believe I'm 85. And so we moved to New Zealand for five years, and I did a bit of well, quite a bit of uh, hiking and backpacking, picked with my older daughter. We did a nonprofit thing, raised money for an eye clinic, and but I got involved in the sector there because people found out my background. I became a board member of Vision Senior Living and chairman of the board of that company. And, and that's very much a lifestyle product like that independent living that I, I had referenced earlier. Uh, but it was great to see how they do that. They have some beautiful communities in Australia and New Zealand. But the girls I've got out of high school, we, they wanted to go to university in America. We moved back in 2012. Okay. And I'm uh, Well Tower, who's a minority owner of Sunrise, asked me to go on the board of Sunrise. So I was on the board of Sunrise for five years. Stephen Vick is a... Uh, <clears throat> 
a real pioneer in the sector. You know, he did Sterling House and um, assisted living concepts, and he had signature assisted living. Well, Tara called him and asked, hey, um, we want you to maybe fix 14 or 16 buildings. We're riding bikes around White Rock Lake in Dallas, and he told me, and I said, well, I'll, I'll help you. I'll just come help you. So he called the next week and said, well, why don't you just come be my partner? So they're off to the go. And then it kept growing with Well Tower. And we have uh, 36 communities, um, previously operated by Brookdale. And then um, Stephen actually had some health problems. So I bought him out. We're still friends. He's coming over two weeks just to check in on the company. And, <laughs> um, you know, the, these um, we had great traction before COVID. And now we're in this whole world of COVID and trying to to uh, maximize that for Well Tower, and they've been great to work with. They're they're giving us the resources to you know spruce up these places, and, and we're excited about a post COVID world. So, some of the biggest challenges for our industry. What do you see them being uh, in the years ahead? Well, right now, if you talk to operators here, you know the old uh, saying in real estate that it's location, location, location. I mean, right now it's labor, labor, labor. And not just, oh, we got to pay people $14 instead of 12 or 16 instead of 14 It's um, at all levels, because I think it has worn people out. I mean, there was a nursing crisis already, and that has been greatly exas that exacerbated by COVID with, with nurses just leaving the profession. We've had executive directors just go, you know what, I, I need a break. I I'm going to travel for a year. I'm going to do something else. And then at the local level just getting people to show up i think it has triggered a paradigm shift with this new generation where they really um they want to they want to have meaning in their lives mm -hmm. they want to be treated with respect and they want a livable wage and you know that, that's not asking a whole lot you can't blame them this is hard work so right now the big challenge is labor i don't you know it was interesting i don't know if you guys saw the economists this morning we had paul krugman and larry uh, summers who are two of the top economists in the world, and they said they were somewhat perplexed by the current times we're in. I think everybody feels that way with supply chain disruptions and inflation. What is what is the future going to be? So, I think for the next uh, twelve to twenty-four months, it is labor, and then it's also hopefully we don't get another variant of the uh, COVID. Uh, besides that, I mean, I think fundamentally uh, there's a lot of demand, particularly for memory care. We're doing a number of memory care conversions. If you do that program right, you're really solving a major societal problem and again for your young people that are looking for careers coming into this sector to have meaning in your life if, if you have a soul you may not know you love it but you're going to get in and you're going to find out that these places are actually a lot of fun mm -hmm. they're places to go live not to go die if it's done right life enrichment is a passion of mine and we don't have the newest shiniest penny you know right. but we can we can win on software we can win on life enrichment and our connections memory care program and that's really the strategy I'm trying to bring to Pegasus well and you may have just answered my follow-up question and that was what is the greatest opportunity for us what, what do you think is the greatest opportunity for your company in this difficult time with labor 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 as you say what would be the flip side of that that you're looking toward I think uh, you know mission one for us is to is to uh, fix the communities that we have from Well Tower, these 36, and that's a challenge. And uh, if we do that, I think the world, the, you know, we, we have a lot of opportunity to become sort of the turnaround specialist in the industry. And to have, a, and we're trying to create a great culture. We're working with uh, Activated Insights on resident employee surveys, which are really trying to drive home the culture. We want to have a very strong recognition program. But if we can fix these 36, I think with Well Tower and then with others, there's going to be a lot of communities because, you know, it, it's hard to do this right. There's a lot of new people in the sector. Some of them have been extraordinarily successful, but not all of them have. And the, I, I think the capital providers are getting smarter and they're, they're seeing that it is difficult to do this on a massive scale. It's really best to have, I don't want to be uh, the, net, the you know, 500 communities. I think if we got from 36 to 50 or 70, uh, m probably would uh, over time get more concentrated in the middle of the country, which is sort of where we're based, uh, would be a lot, would be the opportunity for Pegasus. So take us back 25 years ago, talk to our listeners that were in the same <clears throat> situation or are in the same situation that you were, MBA, banking, you got people out there right now that are thinking, hey, I'm not really digging what I'm doing right now, or now's the time to do something for the future. What would your advice be to them? 
Well, if they're interested in the sector, one would be just job security. I mean, I'm 60, and it's the next 20, 30 years. This is the you know the the the, pot, the pig going through the python, right? Demographically, <laughs> and I think the big opportunity that I don't I don't think it's a Pegasus opportunity per se, but I do think the active adult there's going to be tremendous tremendous growth and diversity coming with the. Uh, you know, uh, LBGT or uh, people who just like organic gardening, just custom ideas on that. You look at the whole ESG movement in Wall Street and how do you have a community that's sustainable? And, uh, you know, triple bottom line with wellness, uh, financial and social. Maybe we bring a daycare in and we have intergenerational programming. I think there's going to be a lot of energy in that in that space uh, in the future. That- active adult community that is traditionally, I guess it's described as 55 plus type. What do you think is going to be, do you think that's going to widen as we saw assisted living and independent, the acuity creep down into even independent living? Mm -hmm. It's kind of what assisted living some of them used to be. Do you think active adult will start seeing more acuity in those communities as well and you'll see delivery of care? Yes, I think it, it, it needs to be done in a way that it's sort of like an airbag where you don't see it, but it's there if you need it. And I think that will be second or third phases of some of these communities. You know, just a, you know, 25 years ago, it was, uh, and I was a demographic geek, that's what was my job was, it was 75 plus. And frankly, one of the challenges is a lot of the demographics on these uh, feasibility studies are still using 75 plus. It's not 75 plus, it's 85 plus. Hmm. And, you know, these people are there because they need care. And 10, 15 years ago, they would have been in a nursing home. And now they're coming to assist living. The 55 plus, I was on a panel with a guy, uh, I don't remember his name, but he, he was in the, uh, the the active adult as it's done now, where it's multifamily and cities. I just, I don't get it. I'm not saying it's not a good idea. I just say I don't really understand it right now, but I will tell you what it's not. It's not 55 plus. <laughs> if they were here, they would tell you that. It's 75 plus. I, I heard of a, of a project that has pickleball courts and they don't have anybody in the building who can play pickleball. So there's a mismatch. If you're going to get people my age to 70, you, it ha- I mean, Jimmy Buffett is coming in and he's showing what you can do with creativity and new energy. I mean, yeah. that dude is a genius, not just musically, he writes books and now he's doing where you can make it fun and you want to make it a place to go live and people will move in when they're 65 or 70 and they'll, they can stay 15 years. I love that. Well, we're hearing a lot about that. I appreciate your insight. I know uh, you're on a tight time crunch. Thanks for spending time with us today. And I know our listeners, Lucas, are going to want to connect. Absolutely. We'll make sure we connect Chris and Pegasus into the show notes so that you can reach out to them and check out what they're doing on their journey. You can also go to btgboys.com and listen to all of our episodes and connect with us there on social. Chris, thanks for your time today. It's been wonderful, Lucas. Josh, thanks so much. You got it. You got it. Thanks to all of our listeners for listening to another great episode of Bridge the Gap. Thanks for listening to Bridge the Gap podcast with hosts Josh Crisp and Lucas McCurdy. If you were informed, educated, or influenced by this episode, we want to know. Leave a comment on social media or contact us in the show notes. Powered by supporting partners, Propel Insurance, Inquire, LTC REIT, The Bridge Group Construction, and Salinity. Learn more at btgvoice.com.